marriage that allows us to reach further into the ocean to get a deeper view. And this is truly cutting edge, pioneering research. They are following uh, what classical scientists do. They explore, they have adventures, they invent solutions to problems. And you're going to see a little bit of all of that. From Constantine Karpov, who is with the California Department of Fish and Game, is the scientist, the biologist who is exploring the ocean. And his partner, Dirk Rosen, who's providing the engineering side to show them how they can get there, to help them, to give them the tools of how they will uh, get to where they're going to go. So I'm going to get out of the way and let them tell you how they have explored the ocean around the channel with the next generation of tools to allow us to learn more about how this place works. So, gentlemen. I bet you thought the next generation would look a lot younger. <laughs> Yeah, as, um, and before we start this, I just wanted to um, uh, thank Gary uh, for the honor of uh, being here, and uh, I, I would like to uh, do a little praise for my partner. I mean, we, we got into this business over a glass of wine in 1995-96, in which we were actually looking at this toy you see up there, and we were actually looking for the apartment. I was curious. How many people have been out to the Channel Islands? Has, has, has everybody been out there? Okay, how many people have fished out at the Channel Islands? Oh, pretty, quite a few of you. How many have ate fish from the Channel Islands? Pretty much everybody. Okay. And are you familiar with the term um, MPA? Does anybody know what that means? Marine, marine Protected Area? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to throw out some acronyms just because we, we normally do and we forget. So. We expect you to, to ask if we say something you don't understand. We'd, we'd like you to just interrupt us. So that, because it's kind of a progressive presentation that we'll be hearing tonight. It all builds on itself. And if so, we don't like your question, we won't answer <laughs> <laughs> So the way we're going to go through this is we're going to start out with a, some video clips of the operation itself, of the data gathering at sea. Then we're going to talk about the need for monitoring in the marine protected areas how the Channel Islands marine protected areas are really a bellwether for not just the state of California, but really for temperate waters in the United States. We're going to show you the sites that we've selected to monitor, the 10 priority sites, show you some preliminary results, and then some highlight video clips at the end. Okay? So first we'll start with the action to kind of get you involved. Do we need the lights? Okay, so we've been operating from uh, Fish and Game and NOAA vessels. This is the Shearwater out of Santa Barbara. It's a catamaran. Our equipment's pretty much plug and play. You can see from this bird, bird's nest <laughs> of cables that the hardest part is remembering. Now, where did that one go again? We have video monitors, and that's the remotely operated vehicle, the ROV itself. And then we go out onto station aboard one of the vessels. Then we launch the ROV into the water, and that yellow cable there is its umbilical, which gives it continuous power, and then we bring up live video continuously. So then we dive the ROV to the bottom. It has six different thrusters that allow it to maneuver, and then it's outfit with a locational tracking system, so we always know exactly where it is, as well as three cameras, two lights, four lasers, um, a temperature sensor, and a partridge in a pear tree. So here's um, the navigation screen, and it's a little hard to see in this clip. There's a little better. But, but Khan lays out transects 
in exact sites that we need to follow with the ROV and the ship. If the ship veers off, off site because of the umbilical, he'll pull us with, with him. So we, we're in this synchronized dance as we fly the transect lines gathering the data. This, and a good subset of the data or what we do is post-processing. And then when the submarine returns to the surface, for every hour we're out there, we're spending 10 hours post-processing, counting the animals, measuring their habitat, etc. Okay, so um, as you may, may know, this was the first large MPA network uh, was in, in California, it was right here in your own Channel Islands, and it was through an emergency enactment because people felt it was, and Gary Davis, who introduced us, was a big part of getting this, a lot of it protected. <clears throat> so it's our bellwether. It's really the one that we have the most data from, and it's the results will have. <laughs> there was a monitoring plan uh, that was held at UC Santa Barbara right before it was in, uh, the MPAs were actually physically enacted and you couldn't fish in the protected areas any longer. The deep data set, uh, the data below diver depths, was identified as a large gap in our knowledge. We just didn't know about the species, their densities, or the biodiversities below about 25 meters, so right around the 100-foot uh, 100, 100 depth zone. So before Khan and I were beginning these surveys, there was no baseline. There was nothing to compare with. It was just a, a kind of a mishmash of data. And what we're doing now is we're trying to create a time series um, through continuity going out every year and examining the same sites. Um, created this assessment tool now and uh, in 2003 we did some exploratory survey we looked for 10 good sites um, we didn't find 10 <laughs> we had to keep looking and um, as the engineer I would say about 80 percent of what we looked at in the marine protected areas was sand then in um, 2004 we started into what we call the quantitative surveys where we had now identified our 10 sites and then we went back to those same sites in 2005 and 2006. Yeah, in 2004, we actually quantified four sites. And here's the beginning of this time series I'm telling you about. All of a sudden, now we have two data points to start creating this baseline. Because we people misunderstand the term baseline. They think, oh, I'm at a snapshot, and I'm going to understand it. No, you only understand it when you see a time series, because there's all kinds of things that change. El Nino, abundance, overfishing. We really want to see what's going to happen over time. And this is kind of, I think this is exciting because in 1980, Gary Davis and his group started a time series on the Northern Channel Island, on the Channel Island, 16 stations. That was so powerful because that 26 years allowed us to make great leaps forward in our understanding of what happened, what's happened to abalone, a lot of the other in fish and invertebrates out there. So, it's, you know, it's kind of, and again, I'm, maybe I'm stressing this too much. To think of it. We did set up 10 sites, and what we tried to do, I don't know if you see this, um, we picked five MPAs, you know, here's the uh, Harris Point State Marine Reserve, here's Turrington Point State Marine Reserve, South Point, um, Gull Island, and Attica. We could get in terms of the type of habitat that it had, and the amount, you know, amount of area surveyed, the depth surveyed, so that we could over time, see what the change happened as a result of fishing and as a result of the MPAs themselves. And why is it not going? Yeah, and as I'm describing this, one of the things that we did try to do is we uh, laid out these rectangles across the reefs that are about 500 meters wide and they're moving offshore. In fact, you can see this is 
Carrington going offshore, and inside of those, and those reefs probably very continuous with some of the Pisco dive sites that you're about, probably familiar with. And in there we would, every year, now that we've got a time series, we put down about 10 kilometers of track line at random location. So we can not only count the fish, but we can also map the habitat. beginning of the new beginning, as, as I'm trying to say here. And you'll notice some of these sites are much longer, like this East Point site, but we're covering about 10 kilometers in order to capture about 4 kilometers of hard substrate. As, as Dirk mentioned, for some reason, there's about a, only a third of the best rocky areas are even hard enough for us to sample because we're focused on hard substrate. It's just, you know, they're just not a, not a good habitat, habitat to quantify here. And why are you focusing on hard substrate? Because I'm hard-headed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I actually, we're, we're interested for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, reef fish uh, are among the most important species that we're looking at. A lot of the invertebrates that we're really focused on, you know, the sandy substrate is really interested, interesting, but it, it doesn't have the diversity that, you, it, that humans tend to be focused on, so there is a, and also, these are the areas that have been most impacted by human activity. Thank you, dude. So now you're going to drill down. Oh, yeah. And what I'm going to do is focus in a little closer to give you an idea of how we designed this. And I think I have to keep pressing, right? Um, and so, for example, let's look at the state conservation area off of Anacapa. This is a kind of a cool area. Um, it's fished, but it's protected for, to some degree. But it's also it's the closest replicate of the of the reserve that we could uh, look at. First, we look at a side scan well, uh, imagery that's provided to us by Guy Cochran of the um, at USGS. We also have multi beam imagery. We look at this and we identify the best rocky habitat, and then try to lay that rectangle that I was talking about on top. of surveys, exploratory surveys, so that when we're ready to start, and we've cemented it finally in 2005, we don't waste our time surveying mostly soft areas because we, we you know, we want to hit the hard substrate as I mentioned. And by the way, you guys can ask questions. I mean, don't, we're not that intimidating. We won't bite your heads off. Yeah. Now, um, these are the random points that we selected. Note there's two color areas. We, we actually zone it into two. This is shallow going to deep. And uh, then on top of that, we fly our lines. These are our target virtual transects that we're able to fly with, with this tracking methodology. And you should you see there, you see some of the lines that we flew. And then we go into post-processing, where we spend that 10 to 1 time ratio, uh, where we start. Let's zoom in and take a look at that a little closer. Um, again, that's 500 meters across the whole thing. Let's zoom in on a smaller area. There's the lines we flew across the habitat, and the first layer we laid on was sand. We layer up, we go review the tapes, and we look for the different habitats, almost like a palette. So we lay on the sand, and then we lay on the rock. That's precisely there within a couple of meters, so we know exactly where they are. And when we count the animals, there they are. And let's look at a 30-meter swath here. And at the 30-meter swath, this is what our samplers see. And you can see as we're flying along, there's a nice vermilion tree fish shot into the hole. We've got a sebastomus there. Uh, and maybe uh, Dirk can explain some of the, uh, the, the uh, critical data that's being collected that allows us to process this into these fine transects and interpret that habitat. So if you didn't see it, this reef that we just flew over is the visual, visual thing that you just saw in that video clip. And it's linked. It's linked with this time code. That's GPS time code, precise to the nearest 30th of a second. Every frame is referenced to position and time. And that's how we can place everything spatially exactly where it is on the planet. The depth meters or feet? Um, they're meters. Meters? Yeah, so um, as long as we're there, depth, so that's uh, 40, it looks like 48 meters. And then um, temperature, we're very metric. Okay. See? And so we're in Celsius, right? Tilt is in metric degrees. Same as regular degrees, right? He's definitely an engineer. <laughs> That's an engineering joke, right? Where are you getting your GPS? Pardon? How are you getting your GPS at 25? At 25 meters? What's your system? 
Oh, well, what we do is the, the you, GPS does not penetrate the water. Right. So we get it on the ship. And then we have, between the ship and the, RO, the ROV, we have an acoustic tracking system that triangulates to a beacon on the remotely operated vehicle. And then you add the two together. There's an offset of the ROV from the boat. Uh -huh. You add that to the GPS position, and then you get your actual GPS position on the bottom. Okay. What, was, what was doing your triangulation? Uh, an acoustic tracking system. Tracking. Sure. Are those acoustic beacons you have to drop ahead of time? That, that's one type. Um, I've always found that that's a little difficult to use. So we use um, a type that uh, it, it's called ultra short baseline. And all that means is that there's one beacon on the ROV and a hydrophone on the surface. So since you asked that question, I'm really proud of the fact that we did a, a, a study to test the precision and accuracy of our tracking because it's actually a revolutionary approach to try to use ultra short baseline see how precise the length is. We found that by measuring the length of the features against actual track line, like we would actually look at features on the bottom, and we found our accuracy was better than two meters in transect length, which is, when you think about it, it's kind of odd considering the WAS GPS is spatially accurate to about plus or minus five meters. But when you compact that over time and over distance, <coughs> it becomes very, pre very precise in terms of its determination of length. And after all, what do we want to do? We want to count critters across distance. We want to know how accurate how that count is. And you're able to achieve that with one transmitter or one receiver? Yes. Wow. Yeah. It, it's it just pretty much they're both acoustic technologies. Um, one is set up for an area and is actually a little more accurate, like the type where you, you place four beacons or three beacons in a quadrant. But then you, if we're, we're covering large distances, we may do up to 11 kilometers in a day, we'd have to be repositioning uh, them all day long. This way we can just operate, keep going as long as we want. We, we're never at anchor, we just keep going. So um, the other things I just want to point out on the screen as long as we're here is we have a, um, this number here, right there, 3.2 meters is the diff distance from the camera to the midline of this screen. and because we know the screen viewing angle, we can calculate, and we know the distance now to that midline, we can tell you that the screen width from here to here, at that instant in time, every second, well, right now it's 4.1 meters. So if we know that the width of the screen, and we know the distance that we've traveled, we now accurately know the area that we have visually surveyed. So then when Khan identifies uh, all of the fish and species, you can, he can determine the density. So that was one of the neat things we got to develop together because of Khan's creative insight. Gosh, I wish I knew how wide the screen was. And a codependent engineer and Khan and <laughs> others worked together. And we came up with a solution. The other thing for piloting, you need to know your heading. And so that's um, the heading there in degrees and then in a compass rows. Um, this is the date. This was uh, September 18th, obviously. And then here's a repeat from the ROV system trying to mimic this down here, but it has its own clock in case we lose GPS time. And then my favorite, that number right there, that's how many loops you've tied or how many bolins you've tied in your umbilical. <laughs> the, the last thing I want to point out is um, on this map here, what's nice is that where you see brown spots like right there and it overlays onto kind of a dark splotch on the map, and you see it happening again and again all over the map. What that means is that Guy Cochran and USGS did a really good job with this map. That it's, it's accurately placed in space. We've had times where we've been out and we've seen features on the map that we never saw when we were underwater. They just weren't there. So that map was poorly registered, which makes it hard for Con to select a good site because we, you know, we're in the right place, but the but the map is different. So anyway, what that said is that this is a good this is a good map. And then the other thing of interest to me is always where are the fish, they're always around the rocks and the transition zones. Unless they're sand dabs. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was trying to focus on time series, and, and here's a way to illustrate it. And I, I think one way to do it is by looking at a hypothetical set of data. And maybe it's most, oh God, what happened to the upper bars of our air? They were there, they were there earlier. <laughs> There's no error on the upper half. <laughs> okay, uh, but if you want to look at this data, and and people ask us, geez, you know, you guys, this is a pretty expensive operation, you know, 200k plus a year. 
why don't you guys just sample every four or five years so you can get more areas, do more sampling. One way you might look at data this way is that trend shows you that there's the, there might be a reduction in stock. But actually, this is really not statistic. There's this kind of variance. This is not statistically different from this. So you can't really say anything about that other than it doesn't appear to be any change. Let's say that we were monitoring an FDA and trying to determine whether it's having any effect just from income, which is a good thing to monitor. Here's, we waited nine years later. What's happening here? Looks like, uh, geez, I don't know, maybe in this case there's uh, no change or whatever. But let's look at the real data set every year and see what the, the trend is. That's a statistically significant increase. What people forget is that um, um, each year, especially when we're coming from the field, dimensions, time and area, as we try to understand whether NPAs had actually recovered any of these uh, species. So back to mapping, here's a, a visual example of how maps can be um, deceiving. This was uh, in 2003, uh, we confounded a, a parasites, one in parasites. I <laughs> And this one is in the reserve off Carrington Point, and um, it was nice uplifted rock, lots of nooks and crannies for fish to hide, and looked like good habitat, good, good site, and it ended up being one of our priority sites. So we looked for something to match it, and just 150 meters away, that there was something by the map, which is, the mapping is always done from above, acoustically looking into the seafloor. We found something that looked very comparable, same depth zones, lots of rock, apparently. But when we went there, while there was some rock, it was really sand dominated. In between the time it was mapped and we went out there, um, it happened to be in a pretty active channel between Santa Cruz and Santa Rosa Island. It, it appears that a lot of sand washed in there, filled in all those nooks and crannies. That habitat was gone. So there was nothing really to see other than a, a couple of fish so Khan had to pick another site, and this was part of why we went to 18 different sites to find 10 good ones. As it turned out, we picked Rose Reef, which is one of our best paired sites to Carrington. Um, but by the way, this brings to my mind one of the other neat things that we'll discover over time is how will these EPAs change in terms of their habitats? When um, you've got a reef area and voila, you have a sand area. I mean, what does that mean in terms of how we cite these NPAs? Um, and what does it mean in terms of the carrying capacity of these NPAs? So understanding the shifts in the habitat is really a crucial question. Another changing aspect 
of, of the islands. Um, this is out at San Miguel, which was the top priority sites for fishing game and, and uh, the Channel Islands because it's harder to get out there. It's rougher, not fished as much. Fantastic habitat. You see, this is very rugged. Scientists call it rugose, but don't ask me how to spell that word. There's fish all over on this site. Big boulders, lots of, again, places to hide, nooks and crannies. Um, what I need to do is I'm going to go back for a second. I just want you to see the time code that you've learned uh, to decipher here. I need this little marker. So it's the, it's it looks like, right. but 826, right? Is that what that's no, saying? Right yeah, but the date. I want you to know that this is the same date. And then you look at the time, 1852. This is Greenwich, meantime. So this is first thing in the morning. You have to subtract about eight hours off. But anyway. We're going to be now 10 minutes later. OK, 826. Now it's 1901. Big boulders, lots of great habitat. But what's different? No fish. Good. Why? <laughs> that, that's why I ask you. <laughs> You're supposed to ask me. Oh. Why are there, why are there no fish there? Oh, OK. It's a response. <laughs> No, I, I, actually, it's a good question, but one of the things that we've discovered out there is that there's a lot of patchiness and fish abundance. But, you know, I was just thinking about that same question last night that you asked at the other uh, meeting. And I remember as a graduate student, uh, uh, we used to actually, uh, uh, there was a, a paper by Parrish, I think that was his name, it was many years ago, they were looking at thousands of the of the tried to go down the visual micro, the vertical migrators went down they were captured so I mean there are things going on here that could be actually feeding going on and around in patches and that's why, one of the reasons why we see patchiness aside from the fact that the other sad part of the answer to that question is my friend Mia Tegner used to describe this as kind of the Serengeti without the wildebeest there's a lot of wonderful habitat out there that just doesn't have anything in it anymore so I mean it, you know question. Thanks for that spontaneous question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and here's a, now we're we'll getting into a few video highlights. This is a giant black sea bass, and a pretty big one, that we um, encountered on, on one of our first observer days. We bring out donors and partners every year with us for a day. Uh, this year we expanded to to-do days, and we were quite nervous as this was the first time we had ever done this, bring people out to see, uh, to see us live in operation. But um, anyway, I'm going to go back because there was something we noticed when we post-processed this data. I need to. Yo, look at the link card right there. Whoops. <laughs> Let me go. I don't know. Did everybody see that? There's a pretty good size. I'll go back one more time because this is pretty fun. Pardon? That's yeah, Anna. He knows his fish out there. Okay. So right there is a very good sized lingcod that didn't dare move a muscle. <laughs> and we didn't even see him because we were focused on the uh, giant black sea bass, which is a protected species. And um, one day, la a year before last, we saw nine in one day. I think last year we saw six in one day, or, or this year. That was the best we saw. But they are starting to come back. And here's a, a six skill chart. It's the second one I've seen in my life, in my career. The other one I saw at Steinhardt. Every once in a while I see some really. <laughs> uh, a friend of my, Dr. Schroeder, and Steve, and D Steve Dixon saw one underwater, and they just hide at the bottom because they didn't know whether it ate people. <laughs> this one's also burying the scars of somebody that tried to eat it. The department is in the dark ages, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, David, that's not what you asked. No, no we actually haven't, and that's a great question. We haven't had good science is telling 
Uh, you ask questions in a consistent fashion, and we like to do it that night. But I try to avoid losing my gear until we get this stuff one question at a time. Night's a little bit more treacherous. And there's a mantis shrimp, and did you watch it jump into its hole, maybe? Yeah, let me go back. <laughs> and, uh, but it looks like we're doing this at night, but we're not. We're actually here at about 50 meters of depth. Most of the sunlight's gone at that depth. Those dots are 11 centimeters, or a little over four inches across, so it's a pretty good size mantis. And pretty ferocious for their size. Not being a southern diver, I guess they are a little bit dangerous, aren't they? They catch you up And and when chased by an ROV, they jump down a hole. <laughs> Behavior, but um, one, but I just wanted to point out is this was in between transects. We don't normally follow animals or chase them. Otherwise, we feel Khan's wrath as we deviated from our protocols. So, but between transects, when the ship is repositioning, if we happen to see something, we might just chase and see what happens. You're flying this line that you're measuring the exact width, 2.5 to 5 meters, and, and you're trying to target 2.6 meters. If a pilot were in bit the saw a fish off to the left and started turning to the right, you would exaggerate your transect width. So you have to be very disciplined in piloting, and you see that compass on the top, it doesn't vary by more than a degree or two when you do it in the transect. We built, um, on sea pens, we built uh, some submersibles uh, about 10 years ago and did all our sea trials off Santa Cruz Island. And at 300 feet, there was a place where the sea pens were about three feet high and this oh. incredible iridescent purple color. And we flew across them in the submersible and it happens, it's a type that it's, it's an all acrylic pressure hull. So you can see behind you, in front of you, above you. When we looked behind ourselves, it was as if somebody had taken a lawnmower and mowed the ones down in the middle. Now, I guarantee I didn't touch any. It's just that they all sucked down. But it was the most beautiful sight. There was plenty of ambient light at, at 300 feet, and they tended to sparkle this incredible color. You forgot to mention that <coughs> Dirk designed and built submarines, worked with Sylvia Earle. He's a pioneer in other areas of research that we haven't talked about, but that's another story. He can talk to you on the side about that. He's more advanced than I am at this point. We promised to talk about uh, sizing. Si and I know the gentleman who asked the question, here we're flying over models of fish and we're uh, the, our pre measured, lasering them and trying to estimate what our, ac our inaccuracy is relative to the center of the, uh, the, the frame of reference. Uh, but size is the other most important component next to abundance that we need to estimate biomass of these animals. That's a really good question. The thing that struck me in flying the models is when we assembled them on the on the boat, they didn't look that big. But when you looked at them through the, the video monitors of the ROV, they looked like some of the bigger fish that we'd seen dur during our survey, which indicates that we're not seeing very big fish. By the way, that has a, a diver depth, and that's at night. So, David, we did dive that night one day. Right? <laughs> the divers don't like And there's other uses for our data as well. Um, last year, in the course of the survey, we discovered 40 pieces of derelict gear, including three uh, large fishing nets, some um, lots of lobster pots. And so we conveyed that information, GPS coordinates, and some video clips to a group called the Sea Dock Society. And then this year, they were using one net. And I never know how you weigh a net. I just weigh it.
academics as well, to start with, with begin to understand fish associations with habitat. You know, depth distribution. In the past, the only way we understood depth distribution is to find out where the hell we hooked them, rather than where they really are. Um, and so, and also divers, we were so focused on diving in diveable depths that we forgot there were deeper depths. So we now have an idea, we're starting to get an idea with this and the Delta submarine uh, about uh, actual distribution so that when the stocks do recover, we'll know what, you know, what they expect, what kind of habitats they expect to find in there. What does that mean? Oh, I'm supposed to say get advantages. There are no advantages to the work that we do. <laughs>
on the, on the sea floor. If there's, in fact, in the central coast, in the Monterey area, there's been a whole new designation of MPA sites that have not been put into effect yet, but we'll have the chance to do the time series up there as well and establish those baselines and see how things change. And then as a statewide assessment tool, uh, ROV can, can do a lot of different types of stock assessments. Um, drag, drag fishermen, where you drag the net and it and along the bottom and start the bottom and, and fish jump up and catch them. I come from Fort Bragg and uh, they introduced a revolutionary gear called lower gear that allowed trawlers to really trawl across the bottom. But one thing that people didn't understand was the habit that it was racking on the tunnels on the, these incredibly old reef structures were basically being destroyed as they were getting the last of those rockfish out of these trawlers. So trawl, trawl has left a, an imprint in this thing. And the real question is to how quickly it's going to recover. In, you know, I, I think that last bullet there is quite important. Um, whether MPAs, I mean, one of the things that we think are going to do with our, our, our protocols is we have a time series to be able to test the effect, the MPA effect, but it's going to have happen in the long run. But also, if we're successful, we have a monitoring tool to look at the effects of management. I mean, when you have, for example, start increasing the abundance, you definitely then can you know, find two managers to look at other data, the actual quantitative data that the manager stands to make the decision and put it to the fish and fish data. So uh, I, I, I'm just a jazz that we're involved in this kind of uh, visual study. So I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is, we can have a question out, question out for you. We're going to be the next generation with the first of all video, video images you've been looking at. They're really poor quality because they're digital with reproductions of what we're doing. Much better quality than that. Next year or so, we're going to be having the next generation of cameras, which is the level of the resolution. And some commissioners want us to put this up on the credit channel. But you all are going to be aware of what now is going to be able to do in the process. You'll be able to see your own backyard for once. To make it, I think, a revolution in changing people's perception of how we treat that environment. That's a good lead into the next slide. <coughs> so, um, last year we were uh, awarded a, a challenge grant from a group called the Ocean Protection Council. And um, basically, the ROV we have right now is one we built 10 years ago, and um, it is what it is, and it's been a real workhorse, and I'm actually quite proud of it. But um, the new one, as Khan says, will have double the camera resolution and about three times the penetration of its lights. You can, you, I don't know if you noticed, but the fish kind of, uh, they're not that colorful until the ROV gets close to them. And that's just because water absorbs the red spectrum of light first and then the orange, yellows, and so forth. And so the fish kind of don't uh, all that dis distinguishable one from another to get some light on it. So the whole imaging side is, is one of the big improvements that's, that's happened in the last 10 years. I'm going to put that into, into the system. What, um, what we, the challenge grant was kind of wise on the OPC's part is they required us to raise uh, our, hard, our hard costs. We're getting about $500,000 a year from fishing game, in-kind contributions of ship time, scientist time, post-processing time, so forth. And, um, but we still have about $250,000 a year in hard costs for spare parts, meals, uh, things we, we break, uh, lease of equipment that we don't have, travel, and so forth. And so we have to come up with that in order to get this new ROV, which is something we're in the middle of doing right now with our, our annual funders. And that allows us to not only perform the, the monitoring here in the Channel Islands and process the data into results, so you'll have the next time series for the next three years, um, but we continue to collaborate with other universities, such as Moss Landing Marine Lab, Cal State University, Monterey Bay, that does a lot of mapping, UCSB right up the, the road. Um, we try, where possible, to engage some of their grad students in meaningful work, helping us post-process the raw video into real results. And then it'll also provide us this, uh, the capacity to explore other parts of the coast. Right now, we have one ROV in the state that's capable of doing this work. And we lost it once on a uh, on an abalone, white abalone cruise. I'm going to fight it twice. I'm fighting it. It's kind of, kind of, in the river water. 
And then you just pray that it flows up to the surface. In the one case, well, both cases, we got it back. But there was, there is no backup, so we feel we're just not, you know, hanging on a thread, so to speak. But um, we couldn't have done this without all of our partners, and there's been plenty of them that have provided in-kind support, financial support, guidance, and so forth. Yeah, and even some unkind support. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, Noah has been uh, very generous uh, in providing vessel time. And, uh, this is, and we use the word con and jerk interchangeably, but it actually this is an, it's like climbing Everest with a team. You, you can't do it. It's a, any real good science takes a real a concerted team. And this private state federal partnership is really going to allow us to go, you know, there's this kind of a synergy that's going to be happening, and it is happening, that um, uh, you know, it's going to work together towards the end. So, I know. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We will entertain questions, and then we have that special treat if you're up to it. <laughs> so, yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. I said entertain questions, that means we'll sing those songs. <laughs> <laughs> you know the answer to it. You know, in truth, uh, yeah, there is, that's a good question. You asked how do we know where the fish are kind of influenced by the presence of the reef? ones that aren't there are the ones we never saw anyway. That's right. <laughs> but w one thing I wanted to add to that is we, we normally fly that straight line and the fish stay put until we get kind of right on top of them and then they take off. Well one of the things we did this survey year is Con wanted to tag live fish with the lasers and you saw the, the fake fish that we tagged with the lasers for sizing purposes. So we were flying through and where we found aggregates of fish we would steer at them then they really took off. Their behavior was much different when you steered at them and pursued them. You know, the, one thing I should stress is that we're very fish-centric in this initial analysis. 